two, one. Hey, welcome to the show. That's becoming once every two or three months, apparently. Uh, I got with me here Charles, a longtime family friend. Hi. Uh, yeah, take a minute, introduce yourself, kind of how you describe where you are and who you are, what you enjoy doing in life. Okay, I'm Charles, and I am 54 years old, and kind of feeling it. Yeah? A little bit. Big hunter guy, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really <laughs> into hunting, and um, I'm also kind of, uh, I guess I'm disabled, so I don't have a regular job anymore. Yeah, I'm what's just... the background for other people, the story of how that became? You were a crane operator. Yeah, I was a crane operator till about a year and a half ago, and um, I started having these strange uh, cognitive issues. Thank you. Yeah, making a little noise. <laughs> and um, I uh, was having a real hard time thinking, and then I started having these weird episodes where it was like one minute I was fine, and then the next minute it's like I'd had five shots of tequila. Wow. So freebie. Yeah, it doesn't work well running a crane. I had three accidents my last week at work and uh, decided I needed to take a medical leave of absence before uh, I hurt someone. Yeah. There's a lot of responsibility in running a crane. If that didn't happen, would you still be driving a crane, operating a crane? Did you enjoy being oh, in the air conditioned yeah. box? I yeah. love running a crane. It's really? so fun. It's kind of like playing a video game. It takes a lot of concentration, but then there's also, uh, you know, a certain amount of math that's involved too. So well, it, it practicing really at the sand pit, like the little kitty sand pit where they have those uh, the cranes that you can operate. Have you ever seen those? Um, they have, like, no, parks I have kids. Oh, really? It parks for kids in like the sand pits. Yeah, there's like two levers. One moves the thing, and the other moves the bucket. Okay. <laughs> so you just go practice there for Oof. professional. It was hard watching that joke. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, most people have seen I them. Like a different kidding. generation, I forgot. Yeah, no, I haven't seen that. You don't, um, you don't go around kids' parks enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, <laughs> no, I don't. We had it growing up. But anyways, so then progressing from there, um, you got <laughs> on disability and you've just been kind of... Yeah, and then they found out earth. eventually that I had Lyme disease. Wow. And that's what uh, was probably causing most of my problems. I'm still having some issues with all of that. Um, I'm still having those weird episodes, but um, I did a year of heavy antibiotics four different antibiotics for wow. over a year and wreck your uh, system oh man wrecked my microbiome yeah i bet Hold and i was time. so proud of it oh yeah your keto and everything you're like yeah it's like i was uh, i hadn't taken antibiotics in years and i was very anti-antibiotic <sighs> rough so yeah and then they just put me on everything and i'm still trying to recover just from that Wow. Is there anything that's helped you the most? Maybe someone listening has Lyme disease or a family member with it. Because it's a very unknown thing. It's hard to diagnose. Hard yeah. to everything, right? Like people don't even know <clears throat> what it really is or does. Yeah. So the main thing with Lyme disease is catch it early. That's like the biggest thing. Um, if you can get treated within 30 days of getting bit mm -hmm. and contracting the bacteria, Borrelia, Burgdorferi, um, then you have a really high success rate of being cured and kicking it completely out of your body. After 30 days, it starts to get a little sketchy. Um, I don't know how long I had it, but at least two years. Uh, so Could have had it a decade, though. It drained at that point. And is it just ticks? Or if you bit someone, would they get it? Um, so <laughs> it depends on who you ask. Worth wow. <laughs> According to um, research... Um, like the CDC will tell you you can only get it from ticks. Um, but there is some research that shows that you can get it from other biting insects. Okay. Um, there's, it's been shown that it can be um, like a mother can give it to the fetus. So oh, the baby right. can be born with Lyme if the mother has Lyme disease. Um, although there are a lot of people that will say that's not true, but it's, it's been... Um, shown in studies mm. that that's happened because mother gives aids to babies or it's like a 50 50 chance if the blood types match up right isn't there something like that i don't know about aids mm. just because they're both like bloodborne, kind of who knows what they are it's been a long time since <coughs> i've learned anything about the human body and anatomy yeah so uh you probably got learned as some about a year ago way more than you ever thought you'd learn about lyme disease specifically 
Oh yeah, like I mean, Lyme disease wasn't really on my radar. Hmm. Um, I mean, I've ha- I have ticks on me every year because I'm out in the outdoors a lot, a lot. Um, just last spring, I was out and I was out backpacking for three days and pulled 28 ticks off me. Yeah. Um, Seems like that should have been an option in your mind. Yeah. Well, I, I just I didn't I never really thought about it, but. Um, uh, to go back to your other question, though, they do say that other um, blood-sucking insects can give you Lyme disease. So a flea, a mosquito. Let's hope mosquitoes don't get a hold of that. Biting flies. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then it, it, there, there is some evidence for human-to-human transmission. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. So they, 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 it's even possible, perhaps, that it could be sexually transmitted. Wow. Because there are, the bacteria likes to colonize the inside of your bladder and your, um, and your, uh, uh, your, you know, your urinary tract. Yeah. So you can see how that would work. Yeah, kind of. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. Um, wow. And so did, if you, if it wasn't initially on your radar, what were you thinking? Because I mean, it's a weird thing when something goes wrong. I just recently had like kind of a health problem where I'm like, oh my, like such a bad stomach ache that, so a friend from California had z- sent me like one or two Xanax. And I was like, oh, I don't think I'll ever use that. And then I had a stomach ache so bad that I'm like, I just need to go to sleep. And I was like, it was like a godsend to have a little bit. And it was like the whole time I was like hesitant to look it up or like take it real or serious. You almost want to like pretend like it's not real or it'll go away. So what was it like kind of like those early days of like, did you just immediately start Googling it like a fiend or? No, the the first when I first started having these episodes, it was scary as heck. Mm-hmm. I had no idea what was going on because, I mean, it would just put me down for hours at a time, and I I um you know I had went to a bunch of different doctors and had a bunch of different tests, and they they were saying things like MS, mm-hmm. ALS. Parkinson's disease, all these like really, really bad diseases that yeah. they thought that, that would, w- they thought that is what I would be ult- ultimately diagnosed with. Wow. Um, but the thing is, Lyme disease mimics all of those diseases. So when you have Lyme disease, it can pr- seem like you have MS, it can seem like you have Parkinson's, it can seem like you have ALS. Wow. And so I just, was lucky that I got um, diagnosed um, thanks to my wife because uh, the testing for Lyme disease that the uh, that Western medicine uses is it has a really high false negative rate. Hmm. So the first test that I took actually came out negative. My my f- primary care physician ordered the Lyme test and it was negative, but my wife was so sure I had Lyme disease that she insisted they test me again and give me um, a different uh, Western medicine test than they had given me. Is there an Eastern medicine test? You keep specifying a Western medicine test. Well, there are they other tests that are more you? accurate that, um, I wouldn't say they're not Eastern medicine, but they're they're not sanctioned by like the medical board. AMA. Uh, the AMA mm-hmm. or the CDC. So it works, essentially. <laughs> so yeah, so if you get tested and get positive by one of these other laboratories that do the testing that's way more accurate Mm -hmm. the cdc won't recognize your diagnosis so insurance won't like cover you getting cured of lyme disease because you still don't officially have it according to the insurance doesn't really cover it anyway unless you get it like if you get it like i said in the first 30 days they catch it yeah then you can get your you know your physician care paid for your medicines paid for but in my case uh none of my stuff was covered insurance here and it sounds like we're gonna have to pay out a lot it'd be way more nicer if we just didn't I mean, it seems like they don't pay anything i mean we moved away from ohp when we got jobs and we we're like holy shit ohp is like the best insurance you can have yes right holy cow yeah i'm on ohp now because i haven't worked in over a year and a half so you didn't at the beginning of it and that's where, like the bad like yeah the i had insurance really, you paid for sucks. i had really bad work insurance too it was it was awful it, i spent so much money in the beginning um and i'm still spending a lot of money now um i would say you know probably 4 to 500 dollars a month Dude. on supplements wow. and some prescriptions just trying to get healed from the damage 
that the Lyme disease did. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on like I'm sure at night you just get mad at healthcare of like how you'd reform the healthcare system or like with changes you'd be like that should be made to healthcare. I mean, there's some that just seem super obvious. Um, you mean where it is where Lyme disease is concerned, just or just the whole in thing. general? Like, so you you've been kind of entrenched in medical care for it sounds like a yeah. year. You must have a lot of thoughts and opinions on like why do they do it this way? Definitely. Um, you know, it's such a comp. That's a really complicated subject. It's so deep. Um, but I would say. Like, it would be nice if you could walk in and know how much whatever you're going to do is going to cost you. Big time. Shop around at different pieces. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's massive. I yeah. Mean, it's weird that that's the one of the only, like, services that you, like, you different land, uh, you know, people who uh, cut up stuff in your yard, you can do them, but you just can't do a doctor. It's like. Yeah. It's like one of the only things that you can't get an estimate. Yeah. Or weird. even. That's a good start because yeah. it's not really political. It seems like a no-brainer. You know, it's not like, oh, like straight to single-payer health care or anything like that. Or right. Like everyone should be completely on their own. It's like, it's just pretty obvious. It's like, hey, you should be able to shop around and know what you're going to expend if you want to get this. And I, it, you know, and I also do think that health care should be like one of those basic human rights. Like it, we should all have health care. Mm -hmm. um, it's ridiculous that people have to declare bankruptcy. Yeah. Um, I heard that bank that medical bills were one of the number one, yeah, like if 30, not the number yeah, one. I think it's thirty three percent of bankruptcies or something yeah. crazy. Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious if you like tested people throughout their entire lives if you think healthcare should be covered by taxes. It'd be funny <laughs> to see all the people that say like, no, 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 no. Like, why should I pay for someone who smoked their whole life and now has lung disease? And then the second that they get a medical thing go wrong with them and just see if they all switch over to yes like just seeing the trend line of someone has a major health problem and they realize how completely screwed you are almost regardless of how successful and mu much money you've saved up mm. yeah still it can screwed completely you drain you yeah you completely can drain you. so much money and anything happens you're like well you're going to get a lot of doctors who don't really give you answers but still charge you a ton yeah that would be a good change to the medical system if they don't help you in any way they can't charge you <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know how that would work, because uh, at least they tried. Yeah. I don't know. Um, it seems like every time I've gone to the doctor, like, I went in for, like, an ingrown toe, and I was like, hey, can you just, like, pr like preventively, like, laser the sides and cut it? They're like, we don't do preventative care. Like, so many examples. Yes. Of, of like, they just, do they really want to help, or do they just want to kind of be like, make more money if we don't help now? One of the things that I would also change is like it seems like they could have, as you said, more focus on preventative care yeah. and also like the nutritional side of things. Start like, a hashtag. Hashtag kill all doctors. <laughs> no. <laughs> Doesn't go trending. <laughs> Might, but. Um, yeah, I don't know about that hashtag stuff. There's no preventative like, care for Lyme disease, is there? Like, you can take preventative care for even HIV now, or like AIDS. Really? Well, I, yeah. theoretically, it's yeah, there is there is preventative care for Lyme disease. There is. So, yeah, like my mm -hmm. naturopath that um, uh, gave me all the antibiotics, she says she has a patient that um, goes out every spring and goes hiking and camping. And so she just prescribes her antibiotics f for, like, the whole spring. And oh, she just so gets as soon as you get it. Yeah, so mm -hmm. when you get bit so like when i got bit last mm -hmm. spring when i had all those ticks on me um there was no chance that i was going to get reinfected with lyme disease because because mm -hmm. i was full of antibiotics yeah, it's called prep that's the hiv prevention yeah. one prep is like you had sex with someone you're like oh you learn they have hiv and you like take it the same day you're like 99 mm. chance you won't get hiv mm. And then tetanus obviously you get a shot like 10 years beforehand so it's interesting to see like how far is preventive care yeah, but, but like I all, of all the times I've ever gone to the doctor, like I can only think of one time when, and that was at the cardiologist when somebody asked me what my diet was like. It's you just uh, the grit and gristle and fat of meat. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's it's yeah. He laughs, but Kenzie and I have seen him eat just like <laughs> well, mostly true, the yeah. fat of a steak. I've and then been a stick in of that butter. place before for sure. <laughs> I've been in that place. Uh, I'm not I definitely know. tried it. After I saw you eat it, I was like, well, I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> oh, you I, did? Yeah. The, the gristle? Yeah, it's okay. Or the fat? I'm not a big fan. Yeah. Yeah. Chewy yeah. and fat's just Well, slimy. some fat's better than other. Like, uh, we all like bacon fat, right? 
Ah, kind of yeah. like leaner bacon. You guys don't like bacon? Not when like the like whole bacon. fucking slice is fat. Like I actually kind of look through the bacon. Okay. So I'll look through ten or twenty to find one that's like there's at least some uh-huh. meat for all the fat. Well, that's about salami, that's like fifty oh, percent. Never eat salami. Okay, I do like salami. Yeah, yeah she she a lot of fat yeah, in that. Deli, <laughs> deli meats. She'll. Ha- uh, so not to make the whole show about medical, but just keep that you know compact in ten minutes. We'll never touch on that again. What got you into hunting, and why is this something that you? you from the outside, it kind of seems like you almost like base your life around hunting when it's hunting season. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I live for hunting season. It's like the that is the thing that is on my mind every single day. Wow. Even before archery season is over, I'm already thinking about the <laughs> archery season the following year and how I'm going to do things differently, how I'm going to prep differently. It's a constant learning thing. But it's how I got into it, um, my father was an outdoorsman and a hunter and um so you know he just kind of brought me up into it from the time i was a little kid had me out there shooting things yeah is it something you'd prefer not to talk about of why you bow hunt compared to gun hunt no i'll talk about it cool i don't care yeah uh, if you had the option to do either would you stay with bow hunting or would you go uh, shooting guns i i would do both Nice. But I can't because I'm a felon. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was... Uh, it's something that's legal and you can buy two blocks away here. Yeah, I was arrested for growing pot back in 2009, back when it was <laughs> just kind of everything was changing. Yeah. Like my attorney said I was like one of the last people to get a big sentence. That must have been great to hear. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> you were like, oh, great. And they, they got, yep. it didn't happen one year later. Well, exactly. If it had, I maybe I wouldn't have had to go to prison for two years for it. Is there anything that can get expunged now that it is legal? I mean, like, it seems like as soon as the law changes, they should look at everyone who got screwed over before that and been like, well, they were just ahead of their time. Well, they should, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> but the problem is um, m- mine is a federal felony. So oh, it's not yeah. federally. So if it's federally legal, that might happen then? Uh, n- <sighs> No, that's not the issue. The issue is that there's no way to get your record expunged through the federal system. Oh, the bureaucracy is so slow that it actually completely stops. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not that it stopped. They just don't have there's a no mechanism. There's just no mechanism. There's no mm. process for getting your record expunged. Weird. Um, the, uh, so well, the only awful. way like I will <laughs> ever be able to get my rights back, uh, like my firearms rights. Um, Voting. No, I can vote, actually, vote. yep. Um, it's, it's that varies state to state, mm, okay. um, and, and in Oregon, I can vote as a felon. Nice. Um, but the only way I can get my firearms rights back is to get a presidential pardon. Wow. So yeah. low likelihood, but never zero. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Not, not zero. Yeah, the federal government don't get F about nobody. Let's get a petition going for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you wouldn't, be the, you wouldn't be the Free first Charles. one to get a petition going. You'd be the first one to get one going for me, though. <laughs> Just for gun rights. Not even, like, for you from wrongful conviction. In, yeah. Like, you're currently in jail for another 10 years. It's like, mm. those ones make a lot of sense. No, he's out. Let he's him fine. hunt. He's, Let he's the man doing hunt. well. He just can't <laughs> right, hunt. Right, he right. lives for hunting. It's <laughs> yeah. like, what are you doing to this man? It's torture. Well, I, I, there is there is a hope for me to get my gun rights back in just the state of Oregon, though, and I'm actually oh. pursuing that. I've given an attorney a pretty good chunk of money to uh, um, petition the court to let me have my rights back in the state of Oregon. That's but it's cool. that will be, you know, my record won't be expunged. I still can't travel out of state with a firearm. Yeah. Um, so that'll mean at the current moment, just bow hunting, you're out in the woods pretty much alone, maybe one other person for 30 days. Mm-hmm. Would you be out and alone in the woods for 60 days consecutively? What do you mean, like 30 bow hunting and then you just like go put your bow in your car or your truck and then grab out your rifle and just be out there for another 30 days eating Mountain House? Or what's that like? No. Well, you can't do that in Oregon. Mm. Um, You You can't can't do both? No, you can't do both the same year. Oh. Oh, I had no No, idea. Yeah, you're really, really in Oregon, you're allowed, you have to choose archery, Mm. muzzleloader, Mm. or traditional firearms. Mm. Um, Like in Montana, though, you can bow hunt and then if you're not successful with your bow tag then it then you can go chase after That'd say elk sense. with a rifle yeah that was what would make sense is like yeah. hey, you can try the bow hunting which is obviously probably a lower likelihood of success and then yeah it is yeah and then if you don't get it then you can still gun hunt rather it's like hey yeah. pick one or the other interesting but if i could do what you suggested i would yeah. absolutely do I, that 60 I, days yeah i would spend 60 days 90 days i would spend every day out hunting wow Maybe. I'd probably have to take some days off at that point. Yeah. And you don't ever feel like guilt for killing the animal. Like, what's your thoughts on, like, 
I'm, I'm going to kill this thing and eat it. It's like it's better than factory farming, and most people eat meat that way anyways, or is it just like it's not actually conscious? Or I wouldn't say that I don't feel guilt about it. Um, I, I always feel a little remorse when I kill an animal. Killing um, something eight times your size? Yeah. I wait. I mean, it's it's a very, for me, it's a very emotional thing to take the life of another um, living creature. Yeah. Um, but you... that being said, I do consume meat. Yeah. And if I'm going to consume meat, I would prefer the bulk of it I take full responsibility for. Ethical. And um, that's happened how many times? How many elk have you got in your life? So um, I believe l this last year was number 18. Wow. Yeah. It's quite a few elk. You yeah. You have all their antlers or anything or like any sort of, uh, memorial or... Yeah, I have an altar. You have an altar? No, <laughs> yeah. I don't. It's in your bathroom. You just sit there it's and take a shit and you just look at all the dead elk. No, it's, um, but I do have a pretty big pile of antlers. I bet. And there's, you know, there's a bunch of them laying around the yard and some in the Your garage. Your wife, please don't get another one this year. <laughs> I'm not allowed to have them in the house. <laughs> trophies or something yeah yeah That's and so i actually fun. have some um taxidermied heads from past times um, your, your favorite ones the ones that looked perfect um no they in actually i don't even have a taxidermied elk i have a a stone sheep a mountain goat do you a, get hunt any animal that you've hunted like what's your favorite one that you have hunted is elk your favorite is that the easiest one to get tags for i would say i do love hunting elk um, it, and it is one of the easier tags to get in Oregon. Score. But I really, really love hunting sheep. Hmm. They're amazing to hunt. They live in these really, really inaccessible places. Like anybody can go out and find an elk. It's always, the, the sheep are always like fenced in with barbed wire. It's hard to get to them. <laughs> right. Yeah, on the yeah, road, yeah, on yeah, the yeah, road, yeah, literally yeah, resting You totally have to <laughs> trespass and sneak <laughs> in and. No, no. It'd be funny if they sold tags and farmers just ha got to account for like write that one off on taxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can go get your own uh, your own sheep before it's like brutally murdered in a factory farm. It's like, well, you kill it and just drag it out yourself. <laughs> well, I've done that too. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. And a so, couple times. Uh, how old were you when you started hunting? Because I still haven't. I have my gun, my hunter safety course. I could go hunt. And yeah. you know, you convinced Kenzie and I two years ago to get tags for elk, and then we heard about lime, lime and we're like, scared eh, you, off. you know what, I'm good, you know, yeah. I'll pass. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I'm, who knows, maybe in three or five years that, that fear will completely go away. I'll take a, a, a not an ibuprofen, but a antibacterial, antibi antibiotic and go out hunting. And if so, maybe I'll love it, you know, just get 18 deer by, or 18 elk by the time I'm 54. Well, we can, I can take you places where you're not going to see ticks that time of year. That's what you say. You're always like, oh, those are a couple miles away. It's like, wouldn't wherever the animals are, the ticks also be? Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, definitely. <laughs> but the, the ticks definitely congregate are more they? around the water. They, they definitely mm. travel on the animals. Um, but they're also, um, the ticks are primarily like in the feeding mode in the springtime. Mm -hmm. So, because you, you said you hunted in spring, right? You said last spring is when you're. I was actually hunting? out scouting for a bear, spring mm. bear. You have so a bear tag? I don't this year. Oh, yet. you're scouting I will have a, a place, fall bear. So when you do have a tag, you know where to go. Yeah, yeah. I was looking for some bear. Actually, at, uh, that trip though, I think the bear season had started, so it was probably the first week of bear season when mm. I was out there when I saw those ticks. I always hear stories about how bears eat a lot of blueberries, their meat tastes better. I'm curious if you could find like a place that no one ever goes and hunts way off in the corner, like they never look there, and you go buy like three or four like baby bears, and you plant a bunch of blueberries, and you set them free there, and you know like, all right, in like five years, I'll be able to go hunt here, and it'll be like the most kosher, best meat ever. Would that be illegal? Can you stock your own feeding grounds? Like if you buy an elk off an exotic... Well, Animals yeah, they like have these, these uh, they call them high fence operations, places where the elk are actually owned and raised by the people that own the land. And hmm. um, they can't escape the uh, land because the fences are so high. Do hunters look down that on That sounds fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it looked down on? It's, n yeah, I mean, it's, it's yes, yeah, a lot of people look down on that, definitely. Mm. I get it. Um, but back to your thing about the uh, the bear tasting like blueberries. So I, what I wonder is like if you could like pen up a bear and just feed it chicken, would bear meat taste like chicken? Mm. 
or salmon. I'm curious if like right oh, after they yeah, eat salmon. Oh, no, yeah, that's they, bad. They yeah. taste bad after they eat salmon? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Because I know salmon tastes bad right after they molt or right after they uh, they breed, right? They like pretty much just die yeah. within a couple yeah, days. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Or so even do, like a steelhead that's spawned. So do the bears eat the salmon after they spawn? That's why they taste bad. Why would a, why would a bear taste bad? After no, they eat them before, but um, I don't know. I haven't tasted them, but that's just what they say like up in Alaska mm -hmm. where there's a lot of bears and there are a lot of salmon. People don't like to eat bears that have been feeding on salmon. Uh, I want to hear one thing straight from you because I had a misunderstanding my entire life. We went to a burger joint down the road, food truck, and the guy said, oh, yeah, I go hunt elk. So, you know, I make um, veal or not veal, but uh, elk, bur elk burgers for like friends and family and stuff. And he's like, I can maybe make you one. But he's like, be warned, it's gamey, as in it was a good thing. And I always thought gamey meant chewy. And he's like, no, gamey's a taste that is a good thing for an animal to have. And I always thought like if something was too gamey, you jerk you. Or like, you know, you'd go a different direction with it. What is gamey meat? What causes it? And do you look for it or do you hate it? Um, yeah, so gamey meat, I don't really like gamey meat. Um, you know, all all wild game is going to taste different than, say, like a, a beef. Or, you know, like a w wild pig will taste somewhat different than domestic pig. What's the difference? I don't know on pig, but... Um, S and well the gaminess can it it can be caused by a different a lot of different things um one of the main things is the diet of the animal mm. so um you know like black-tailed deer that live on this side of the mountains here you know on the west side of the mountains like i, I don't know what their diet is but i Bad. i just do not like Wow. to eat blacktail because it's too gamey yeah it's not is that one of those things where people always say if you shoot it and then you chase it it tastes worse does that makes it gamey that is uh another thing i've heard um mm -hmm. although um i've eaten animals that have been in that situation taste the and, stress and or it, something i i couldn't <laughs> i couldn't taste the stress yeah no i was I stressed couldn't. out that week though <laughs> but definitely i mean that there may be something to that um but the other thing is just like care of the animal um, yeah. how you care for the meat and the, like in the field and then when you mm. bring it home and butcher it yeah. um, or how your butcher cares for it if, if you just send it off to be butchered. Do you send it off to be butchered? Do you do it yourself? I do it myself now um, and I've probably done 75% of the animals I've harvested over the years by myself wow. um, but there was a point in my life um, when I was a pot grower and I had a lot of money. I was paying a butcher to do it. Nice. And I had a bad experience with one butcher. Um, Took all the good good pieces? No. Wh what he did was um, uh, he, when I got my meat back and I had the ground meat, the burger, I tasted it and it, and it was very gamey. Mm. It tasted awful and it didn't taste like the rest of my elk. So you gave him some of it? Or like the, it didn't taste like the rest of that same elk or the rest of like in terms of another elk that you've gotten? It didn't taste like that same elk. Oh, okay. Like so the, the other cuts of the meat. Yeah. And so when, so I came back and said, hey, what? there's something wrong. This burger's off. What's the deal? And he says, oh, what we do is um, we put everybody's burger in the same batch. <laughs> so y your elk had, you know, Ew. so many pounds, pounds of burger meat. So we threw it all in the same bucket and then uh, we grind uh, it all up. And then, and then you just get however much you put in, you get out. But it's mixed with everybody that's else's. Up. I'd be beefed. <laughs> oh yeah, I, uh, I never, I never went back to that guy. Yeah, why would you? That's Definitely no, that's no not. Good. And and then every other butcher after that, I always asked them if that was a Don't practice. Don't you fuck with my elk? <laughs> yeah, but you asked when I um, <coughs> first started hunting. Yeah, and I was probably four years old. My dad used wow. to take me out to shoot sage rats. Wow. Before we get to the beginning of your hunting. When you're out there, do you eat any of it raw? Like, do you, are you someone who like eats the heart and like cries and kneels down, or like, do you do any of that, or do you just like cut it up, bring it back? You don't eat, eat any of it while you're out there. Oh, I'll eat some of it when I'm out there, but not raw. Not raw. So you like no. make a little fire and put like the liver, or you know, what do you what do you cook? And eat um, out there? generally, if I'm gonna cook something while I'm out there, it would probably be like the tenderloins. Mm. Yeah. So just eat the best part immediately. Sure. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, um, I just recently started keeping the tongue hmm. and that would be something else I would maybe consider eating while I'm out there. Put in like a stew or you cook it up like regular meat. Um, what you do is you, you actually boil it. Huh. 
Yeah, you boil it for several hours, and then what? you peel this, and then the skin peels off if you if you can dunk it in some cold water or ice. Soft boiled tongue. It's so good. I kept the tongue for the last the first time last year, and you ate it. Oh, it was so fantastic. I didn't eat it out there. I brought it home and ate it. But mm. yeah, you I mean, you, but you've heard of a lengua taco. No, I haven't. Yeah, you can get beef. that at any taco stand. Yeah. Beef it's tongue. Yeah. Beef tongue. You don't eat Rocky Mountain oysters. I know that's like bull, but you don't eat it with the elk, do you? You just like leave all the entrails. You have. Oh, you, yeah. But you leave like the guts and like the brain. Like like you leave a lot of it there, right? Yeah, yeah. I leave the, the, a lot of the bones, the hide, the guts. Uh, uh, the guts. Yeah. But I keep the entrails. liver, the heart. Um, I tried keeping the kid a kidney this this last year, and and now from an elk at least was not edible. Mm. Not edible? Is it too hard? What would it be? Not edible? Just tastes shit. It tasted like piss. <laughs> That's what I'd imagine it tastes like. That's yeah. why I'm always surprised the liver doesn't taste bad. Not just like any piss, like elk piss, uh, yeah. which has a very Ap- distinctive yeah. aroma. Is it like him, goats or like horses? Probably, I would imagine it's you know it's maybe not the exact like olfactory <laughs> profile as a goat but um i'm sure it's like uh, I imagine goat piss is very strong smelling mm. the way that you said that yeah it's pretty gross yeah and elk piss is really strong smelling one day at a taco restaurant i'll be venturous enough and i'll eat tongue it's pretty good wow, oh it yeah. is fantastic yeah, it's pretty good yeah and i mean if they're boiling it for hours it's, they clearly put time into it so yeah you were four and you're killing little rats and stuff and then you're just like i just Sage love rats. killing stuff what is a, a sage rat just a, a rat? Sage rat, sage rat is um, oh, they actually have another name, but that's what we call them out on the east side of the mountains. Um, they oh. are a type of ground squirrel. It's not so. a shrew. Shrew isn't the other name for no. it. No, no, shrew's not a squirrel in any way. <laughs> There's just some level of word association. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'll throw it out there. Now they also call them fence posts because they just all stand out there on their hind legs like this and. Mm. So and then it's uh, line up a squirrel, pretty much. Yeah. Nice. Or a sage rat. Sage rat. And you wouldn't eat that though, would you? No, you don't eat sage rats. Yeah. But they do a lot of uh, damage to farmers' mm. land, so farmers are always happy to have people come out and kill them. Would you be one of those people who's up in a helicopter in Texas shooting boars with like a machine gun? Like, do you enjoy it to that level, or you just enjoy it to like the skill level of like, you know, kind of like sniping one animal? <sighs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I would maybe try that because it'd be good for. It's like you. It's not something you feel guilty about. Like those boars are invasive. They they are invasive, definitely. Yeah, and and I guess I could maybe find some way to justify it that way. Um, but no, I'm, I'm not like I when I was a kid when I was young and my dad was bringing me up. Like my dad's theory was like. If it moves, kill it. Yeah. Whether it's legal to kill it or not, doesn't matter. You mm. just shoot everything that you can. Probably started liking that because he was like, nice reward and praise for doing totally, it. And you're like, oh, yeah, more. Totally. And then he was, you know, like, oh, w- you know, have you ever killed one of those kinds of birds? No. Well, then you should try and kill one. And <laughs> bald eagle. <laughs> yeah. No, I never <laughs> killed a bald eagle. Um. <laughs> he just says that one day. It's like. That's like a federal crime. <laughs> it is totally a federal crime. I, actually, that was the one thing that my dad discouraged me from killing were birds of prey, oh, which is good. kind of odd because um, cause he encouraged me to kill every other thing that was against the law to kill hmm. um, and as many of them as I could. So um, <laughs> Even people? Yeah. Sorry. Well, I mean, it, it worked out. Uh, raising, you know, you turned out to be pretty decent, so it's not too bad of a way to raise a kid is give him a gun at four. Isn't like something like 10% of deaths in a household from a toddler with a gun, though? Like, I like, don't know. It's like a crazy high amount w- of people I, yeah, who are shot in their own homes uh, aren't from an intruder or like self or like screwing with it themselves. It's a, like a kid under the age of five gets a hold of a handgun. I believe it. I mean, when I, when I was growing up, we had guns all over the house and they were loaded. Wow. And, you know, my dad, you know, he just told us, don't ever touch the guns. And then like one of the first things i remember is my dad took my sister and i out on a hunting trip with him and shot a rock chuck which mm-hmm. is a it's actually a marmot but we call them rock chucks over there and over there um, ben. and he shot it with the 22 250 and it pretty much like turned it inside out and he 
you know, brought it o- brought us over to look at it, and he said, "This is what happens if you play with guns. This is like what will happen." Yeah. I was just about to, to ask you. how you impress upon a kid how yeah. important uh, yeah. don't touch this because you say, "Oh, oh, don't like do drugs, like don't smoke weed," and then you know the kid tries it and it's like, "Is everything I've been told a lie?" But it's like with a gun, you have to be like, "No, this is different." Yeah. Well, there was two <laughs> things. Like, I had no desire whatsoever to really play with guns because number one. My dad was like, yeah, if you play with guns, what you see there with that rock chuck, that's what's going to happen to your sister. But the other thing was, anytime I wanted to play with a gun, I could just ask and my dad would like show me how to, you know, we could could go out shooting all the time. And if we weren't going out shooting, you know, he'd show me how to take apart a gun and clean it or, It wasn't until later in life that you did play with a gun, right? In a car with a friend. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Is that a story you tell? Because that was one of the stories that I'm like, wow, that would be a brutal thing to be driving. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm an open book. So, right. yeah. Set I'll the talk. stage. Yeah. I'll talk. Uh, so, I used to carry, con- I had a concealed <laughs> handgun permit in Oregon. So, I always had handguns around in the car. And um, I was in Southern Oregon. And it was my mother's birthday. And we were all meeting down there. Uh, because that's where my mom's mom lives. We have some family down there, so we were celebrating her birthday down there. I was with my girlfriend, and we had gone on a pretty vigorous mountain bike ride. It was a hard one. And um, and then when we got to the bottom, we smoked a joint. So I was breaking a bunch of cardinal rules. Um, I was high. I was driving. Um <laughs> Playing with guns while we were driving high. Uh, You're not the best mix. <clears throat> but I, I used to I used to carry this um, uh, Smith and Wesson Model 38, and um, my brother-in-law he wanted to he was looking for a, a concealed carry gun, and so he wanted to he wanted to know what it would be like to carry the Smith and Wesson Model 38. So. Um, he asked me if he could borrow mine for a couple of weeks to carry it, and I said yes, as long as you give me something to replace it with, because that is the gun that I keep in my truck. Okay. So he said, "Sure, I'll give you my um, my uh, my 45 uh, Model 9, 1911, which is a little semi-automatic 45." That's great safety features, right? Yeah. Well, it's it's actually yeah, it's got a grip safety and it has a thumb safety. Mm. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> besides that, um, my girlfriend, she noticed that I had a different gun in the truck because mm. she'd driven around with me a lot. And she's like, well, you have this, wh- where, where's your other gun? And, um, I was like, oh, Dan's got it. He, he's loaned me this, this pistol. And, um, <clears throat> she's, we were talking about it, <clears throat> excuse me. And she Somehow it came up that I was not keeping a round in the chamber of the 45. And I had a reason for not keeping a round in the chamber. And that was because my dad had shot himself in the ass with a 45. In the ass? Yeah. Putting in his waistband or what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. He had it in his waistband and he, uh, he blew a hole through his ass, <laughs> through, the, through his butt cheek. And That's then it went into safe. his calf and lodged between his Achilles tendon and his, and his leg shot bone. shot twice in one round. <laughs> yeah. That's brutal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you yeah, got one. It's three got holes. Entry, entry, exit, and another entry wound. Yeah, and then, and then the place they cut him open to take <sighs> it out. So anyway. So um, you had one of these guns in your possession. You're like, great, this is a great yeah, gun to have. But I'm, well, but I'm not going to keep a round in the chamber, which, yeah. you know, whatever. One more level of safety. Yeah, just one more level of safety. And she said, well, what, you know, what, what good is a gun if, you don't, if it's not loaded or oh you don't have a round <laughs> in the chamber? And I said, well, I can put a round in the chamber really fast. Yeah. And, and she goes, well, what, sh- I don't know why she said this, but she said, well, what if you only had one hand? Because <laughs> you have to work the slide and it takes two hands. <laughs> and, and you're driving while this is happening. And I'm driving while we're having this conversation down I-5 on the way to my mom's birthday. <clears throat> and I said, I can put it round in the chamber with one hand. She's like, what? How do you do that? And so the military police have this trick that they would do with their, with because they would carry 1911s back in the day. And they would draw the gun and they would use the front sight and they would um, catch it on the side of their pants mm-hmm. and use that to actuate the slide. 
So, Which by doing so, you'd be getting rid of the, <clears throat> the grip safety because you're pushing into it, right? Yeah, but actually, I, I have to back up a little bit because I was showing her the gun. So I took the clip out and handed her an empty gun. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't paying attention. I'm driving, I'm high. And so she looks at this gun and she's checking it out. And then I did not see it. But at some point, she reached over and got the clip and put it back in the gun. She really wants a round And then gun. she handed it to me and said, show me how you would do this with one hand. Well, I, I had bicycle shorts on, so I couldn't do the thing on the pants. So I did it on the floorboard. And I had carpet. And when I did it, a little piece of carpet got caught in the slide. Well, I didn't realize I had just jacked a live round into the chamber. Um, and I want to say, like, this is, like, the only time I ever remember someone handing me a gun that I didn't check to see if it was loaded. Yeah. And it, had I done that, the whole accident would have been avoided. It's the definition of the one time that you don't do it, yeah. it will happen. Right. So, um, and when you, when, you, um, when you put, when you actuate the slide, it locks the hammer back so it's ready to pull the trigger and fire. And so me thinking it was unloaded, I just pointed the 45 down between my knees towards the floorboards and pulled the trigger to drop the hammer so that it wasn't just left up. Yeah. Rational. And um, <laughs> the gun went off. The round went into my steering wheel and ricocheted off the steel part of my steering wheel and went into my leg just above my knee, hit my... Um, femur tracked down the femur and as soon as it hit uh the knee joint it slid right into the joint I, it must have had some kind of weird side velocity because it actually slid down the bone and then into the joint and lodged in the middle of my knee joint so not too bad a quick in out through <laughs> kidding no it didn't go through it <laughs> the stayed exact in worse of yeah like, it's everything that it possibly could yeah and, and so you're driving six. Did, wait, was it your left or right? No, so actually, when this happened, we weren't driving. We had pulled off because we missed. Because ah. we, we were playing with the gun and we're high. So we missed the exit to go to my mom's birthday. <laughs> okay. So we were actually on this overpass when this happened. And we were stopped at the overpass and in a line of traffic. And I shoot myself in the leg. And, um, and uh, Cammy just, she started screaming, just <laughs> nonstop screaming. Very helpful. Yeah. yeah, and I'm looking at my leg, and there's a big hole in the side of it, and I thought for sure that I'd, you know, shot through the bone. Um, and so I said, Cammie, I've shot myself in the leg. I need you to calm down. <laughs> there's, a, there's a gas station about a half a mile ahead. We got to get there. Um, I cannot shame. move my leg, so I'm going to work the clutch with my right leg, and you're going to work the throttle, the, the accelerator pedal, yeah. with your left leg. And we're going to drive down to that gas station and call an ambulance. You didn't call, uh, you know, bring out your inner Pulp Fiction and say, we're going to be like the Fonzies. Bitch, we're going to be cool. <laughs> <clears throat> I didn't. No, I, I don't recall saying that. I may have. Probably a blur. If I think it, this was actually before Pulp Fiction, though. Oh, that existed? Yeah. In my lifetime. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so... That's nutty. And then so you, was it just hazy or like you go to the, the gas station and then you go to a hospital? And no, it wasn't hazy at all. Um... No, we, yeah, we made it. We killed the car the first try, and then we got it going. We drove down, pulled in, stopped. She went in, used their phone. You were in shock, so you weren't in pain, or were you just I wasn't really in shock at that point. It, it didn't hurt as much as I would have expected. Like, if, if I was to, like, hit you on the side of the leg as hard as I could with my open hand, just slap it, that's mm -hmm. what it felt like. Huh. Yeah, yeah, the body isn't probably, like, used to feeling that in any sort of, like, way that would help benefit you. It probably just doesn't know how to recognize it. Like a bullet yeah. going into you. Like, I mean, if it fuck? had broken the bone, it probably would have been ah, way, bad. way more You kind of got lucky that it didn't ricochet anywhere up yeah. for either of you. You know, it like, first off, it didn't hit your genitals. It hit, like, below <laughs> your thighs. Priorities. It yeah. didn't, it didn't yeah. hit your, your <laughs> yeah. big, big artery. It's like, wow. Like, if you, I mean, you got, quote, unquote, lucky when you shot yourself. Well, you know, the thing that is. That could have gone bad. Yeah, well. I got lucky in that it <laughs> hit the steering worse. wheel and it and it reduced the velocity enough that it did not break the bone. But the other thing is, is if it hadn't hit the steering wheel, it would have just shot a hole through my floorboards and I wouldn't have got shot in the knee in the <sighs> first place. Brutal. So you're yeah. aiming it kind of at the steering wheel? Yeah, you I was just, just holding it. Like I just pointed it, you know, in a down. safe direction, which was down and and it just... And with an, a bolt that shouldn't have been there, you didn't account for ricochet. <laughs> no, not at all. So, yeah, and then the ambulance came. Actually, the cop showed up first. Mm. And when I saw him pull up, 
I actually picked up the pistol and unloaded it so I could and and uh, lock the slide back so I could hand him an empty weapon. And um, nothing cops love more than people holding guns around them. I would just like set it somewhere. I actually did just set it on the okay, seat. Nice, when yeah. he when he came up, I told him that there the, where it was sitting. So he, then he took it, and uh, we I got it back a couple weeks uh, after that. But yeah, I went to the hospital, and it turned out my uncle was the uh, head of the ER. W department where I went in and so he was there and um, I uh, eventually got in they had to operate to take the bullet out and I spent uh, I don't know two or three nights in the hospital did she ever just apologize for it or was she like that wasn't my fault in any way mm, and at some point you had to like you just know, really look at I, it like, why'd you load it I take full responsibility for it because like I said I, it was my responsibility to check and make sure it was unloaded. You're clearly not Jason Bourne. You didn't like notice that there's a slight weight difference. Isn't that the whole thing? Is like some people can like tell if a gun's loaded or not. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, there probably probably are folks like that. Um, although that skill may diminish if they just smoked a joint. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. You know, they have to be like, this is my rifle <laughs> and kind of driving, person, yeah. the yeah. full metal yeah. jacket guy, where you just got yeah. one gun, you know, the exact everything about it. Yeah, I would n probably never go gonna have one of those guns in my. Uh, just after knowing that your dad shot his bow with it, you shot your knee with it. It has a horrible safety mechanism. I'm like, that's a gun. I don't it's need actually not a horrible safety mechanism. Oh, I was saying it facetiously earlier because I'm like. Uh, Obviously, it sounds horrible. Yeah, no, it's not. They actually have, a, they, like I said, they have a thumb safety like a lot of handguns, but they also have a grip safety. So if you, if you don't have your hand on the grip you, and you're actuating that um, grip safety, you can't fire it. So when it happened to your dad, he was putting it in his waistband. It wasn't just sitting there. It was like the force of his... Uh, my, my dad, he's... Who knows how it happened. No, I know how it <laughs> happened. Exactly. <laughs> Um, they they were out going out to dinner in Portland at this really fancy restaurant that had indoor parking basement and so um, they had left the restaurant and my dad he had just smoked a joint no, he had just <laughs> smoked <It's> like identical <laughs> stories <laughs> no but my dad had this habit he always carried that 1911 and so he had a habit of he would reach and check and make sure it was on safety but how he would do that is he would take it off safety. So he'd click it off safety and click it back on safety. Yeah. And it was just this habit that he had that he thought was safe. And what happened was he had his wallet in his back pocket and um, with, the, the, with the pistol in his waistband, the wallet was actually pushing the trigger, the corner, the of, the corner wallet. of the wallet. Yeah. And so he put his hand on the grip and actuated the grip safety. Yeah. And then as soon as he flicked it off safety, it went off. So ironic how he's doing something for a safety precaution. Yeah. And it gets you shot. That's so many things in life where you're like, I'm going to go out of my way to do something, and then it has the exact opposite effect on your life. It's scary how often that happens, especially in conversations. You're like, I'm going to be this person, and you just come off as the other person. It's a yeah. It's, it's yeah. Human those, curse. Those times happen too often. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, so we know crane operator, lime, hunting. Yeah. Is there any other like aspects of you as a human being? If you're encased in an hour, we got like 15, 20 minutes left. Obviously, we can go however long, but an hour is a good amount of time, you know. What's uh, is there any other aspects of your life that you find like interesting that you enjoy talking about that you're motivated by? Or um, I'm. Or are you a three-dimensional person? <laughs> no, I'm. I'm very motivated by spirituality. Mm. Yeah, so I'm kind of on this path where I want to um, be more conscious, be a more evolved human. Is that like the Joe Dispenza route or the ayahuasca route or the meditating route or the reading or like, like what's to dive into a little bit? Um, I've tried all of the above. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, obviously I've done quite a bit of reading um, and I've read Joe Dispenza's couple of his books. Um, uh, I have for the last 10 years, most of it had a pretty dedicated meditation practice. 30 days in a row, once a year, <laughs> just when you're out hunting. <laughs> no, no. Um, I've meditated like every day for years in a row. Wow. How long each day? Um, uh, at eight, eight hours a night? A minimum of 10 minutes. That's good. Which is, is pretty short, but, um, but as long as two hours. Mm. Yeah, it just kind of depends on where I'm at and what I'm doing. 
you know, when you're when you're working a fifty hour a week job, it's hard to meditate yeah. to find the time to meditate for very long. What's your rationale why you do it? Like if you've done it for all this time, what have you gained out of it to where you wake up and you say, I have a busy day. I'm still gonna carve out ten minutes to an hour to do this. Like what do you get out of it? That makes it like I'm gonna still do this. Yeah. Um I definitely get um it helps with my stress levels. Hmm. Um, it helps me to deal with stressful situations during the day better. Hmm. Um, it just, I, I'm one of those people that likes to meditate first thing in the morning. Hmm. Um, and it just kind of sets me up for the day. Do you feel best in the morning and then worse throughout the day? Because I've noticed I feel worse in the morning. Worst in the morning, I feel great, like as the day goes on. Yeah, right now, um, I'm kind of on this deal where I, I actually don't feel that good in the morning, mm -hmm. which I think has to do with the Lyme disease. Um, like yesterday morning, I woke up and I was having one of my episodes mm -hmm. when I got up, which is pretty miserable. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so if you're um, done with antibiotics, you're just taking like Chinese herbs or medicines? Or yeah, just I'm taking some Chinese second. herbs now. <clears throat> um, I feel think that the th I think that the um, the Lyme disease caused a significant amount of damage to my brain and my central nervous system and I even though I've got the the bacteria knocked down um, it, it's still in me mm -hmm. and um, I still have that damage but I believe it's healing slowly so I, I do overall I'm trending towards feeling better nice every day good trend line yeah, but I still, you know, it's not straight up. Yeah, it's you know, like it's, everyone wants it to be. Yeah, like I, I definitely backslide. Like I had a couple of really bad weeks just recently, um, and especially since I started these Chinese herbs, they, um, I believe, I'm having kind of a Herxheimer reaction mm. from know. those. Don't know what that is, but before we get back to meditation, how how do you think it changed you as a human being? There's like that great saying. A healthy person wants 10,000 things. A sick person just wants one thing to like be at back at 100%. Like, have you known, especially that's like when someone's sick, even for a day. Like, I had this the horrible, horrible stomach ache for like six hours. And I was like, I couldn't think of a single other thing than laying on one side, laying on the other. It was like just anything. I was drinking apple cider vinegar, like anything. I'm like, please make this go away. Yeah. But like, over the course of years, obviously, you can't have one singular thought. Like, how, how do you think having something that's maybe blocked meditation, like just in the flow of life or like... How has it changed you? When you say something that's blocked, it, you mean the Lyme disease um, or the illness or? Blocking, you get in the flow state of this and then you get taken out because of pain. Like like when I was younger and I had really bad back pain, I was like, nice, I'm really enjoying this, like watching this movie. Right. And then okay. I was like, ow, I have yeah. pain. Yeah. It's like it like takes yeah. you, it blocks yeah. you from enjoying, you know, well, certain things. I am at this point in my spiritual path where I am finding that everything can be a lesson or a, or a, or a, or an opportunity to practice. Hmm. So even feeling sick or being in pain um, is a it's actually a great opportunity to um, you know like sit with that pain and um, you know feel into it and see what it's really kind of all about. Investigate it. Yeah, investigate it. Is this something you developed when you're in prison? It seems like you hear a lot of stories about people who are, you know. That's when I found spirituality. It is. was in prison. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a lot of people, there's a lot of stories of people who it, were at prison at one point in life and now they're very spiritual. Yeah, I learned to meditate. When I went into prison, I had two goals. Learn how to play the guitar. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and learn how to meditate. And I found a teacher in prison, and uh, he taught me how to meditate. And then not guitar, though. No, he didn't. He <laughs> didn't know how to play guitar. Teach you both. <laughs> uh, no, I taught myself how to play guitar. So you could be that person if you're ever in prison to teach someone meditation and guitar. Yeah, but hopefully I won't be. Yeah, hopefully, but <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not that outrageous that someone could teach you both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so you've been—I mean, that's like however long—20 years, 15 years—you've been meditating every day. Um, I started meditating in 2010, so 12 years, but not every yeah. day. Like, um, I actually haven't been meditating now for a couple of months. Mm. Um, it's all it takes is one day. It's, I wrote like yeah. a short thing about it. It's like, it takes one day to build a habit and just keep compounding one yeah. day and then one day yep. to lose a habit. It's like, okay, just today I'm really busy. I'm not going to do this. And it's like, 
it's gone. It absolutely it, it does slip away so easily. But that's where it's like because I've done so much meditation, like I can just go, okay, I'm just going to meditate for 10 minutes. It doesn't take anything to meditate for 10 minutes. Oof. Speak for yourself. <laughs> really? Yeah, no, it's tough for me. I enjoy yeah. it the whole time. I'm blaring the Jesus album. Well, <laughs> if, yeah, because you guys spend a lot of time together. Like, I have a really hard time meditating when my wife is around. Because mm. oh. you could be hanging out with her. Or no, it's just, you know, it's, she's loud. Um, it's this nagging voice, not in my head, but <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> but out in reality. Well, no. it's, it's actually kind of weird because when I was in prison and meditated in prison a lot every day for hours sometimes, um, prison is a very loud place. So I got used to meditating where there were a lot of distractions. Um, but then when I got out, I got used to meditating without distractions. Mm -hmm. And so um, sometimes Donna and I will try and meditate at the same time. Uh, to kind of alleviate the distractions. But then I do find myself after a certain period of time wondering, well, is she done meditating? I wonder what she's meditating about. <laughs> no, I don't wonder about that. But I do wonder, <laughs> like, is she done meditating or, you know, or whatever. And, you know, maybe sometimes she'll, she will be done and she'll it's get It's just up. another test or time to practice. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It is. Yeah, it is. definitely. I, that's definitely a good way to live. I, I go in and out of seeing, like, every time you see someone you just, like, can't stand or hate, you're like, all right, they're here to teach me something that, yeah. you know, like, like, and then sometimes you go out and you're like, no, I just hate that person. I just don't want to be around. <laughs> <laughs> like, I go very in and out of that spirituality of, like, yes, I understand that it's all, like, this woo-woo, and then at certain points I'm just like, sometimes I'm just not there for it. But I'm, I'm probably better off when I am there for it, to, to, for that said. So do you think the past couple of months of not meditating, you've been worse off? Are you going to get back into it, or...? Oh, I'll definitely get back into it. I mean, it was on my mind yesterday morning. Yeah. I was thinking about meditating. In your hammock. That's the last thing we can touch on, that we got to touch on. <laughs> <before> <laughs> we hammock. got another couple, five minutes. What do you sleep in every night? I sleep in a hammock. At your own house? Everywhere. I bring a hammock with me when I travel, a hammock stand. <laughs> How'd we almost forget talking about this? I know, right? Yeah, I've been sleeping in a hammock for probably two years straight now. Two years it's I've not slept in a hammock. permanently banana-shaped. You have like a, a curve to your body. You lay in a normal bed and your feet and your head's up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. guess that's a hammock if you lay in it wrong. You're supposed to lay like diagonal in a hammock, right? Yeah, you'd lay in it. But you still have a little bit of that curve even well, yeah. when you do that. Um, it doesn't usually. Bug you. It doesn't bug you that you can't no. roll over, that you can't cuddle someone, or that's, you know, it's like no. the fact that you're in a hammock. And not well, the, w the one thing that it could maybe bother is like the cuddling thing. Like you can't cuddle in a hammock. I mean, you you can cuddle in a hammock, but it's just not real comfortable. Your bedroom's just a bed and then two hammocks on either side of it. <laughs> Basically. Like right when we get tired enough, then we switch over to the hammock. No, we have we, we still have a bed at home, you know, that we uh, cuddle in. It'd be weird to have a house with no bed. Like you look in their bedroom, you see a, a hammock. Like, All right. <laughs> Close that door. Yeah. <laughs> Jen, yeah it's, uh, well, Don and I, we have we each have our own rooms. Oh, that's the way to do it. Yeah, and so we each have a hammock and a bed in, in our rooms. Nice. Yeah. Uh, it's, as you can tell, we, we sh our living room's our bedroom, which probably no one listening to the show knows. But we, m we made our living room into our bedroom. One of the bedrooms a podcast room, and then the other room's like a, you know, clothes, storage. Storage. Pretty much, but like a place to chill. It's like, yeah. But ideally, like, if we had a big enough house, we'd each have our own rooms, too. There's just something to it where you can just completely be like, okay, you don't have to ask someone else what you want that room to be decorated like and stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's nice to have your own room for sure. Um, you must be an only child. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but I was going to ask you, like you've slept in the hammock, or not slept in the hammock, but you've, I know you've gotten into hammocks you've a little dabbled. bit. Dabbled yeah, you've dabbled. you've dabbled, yeah, in the <laughs> last year or so. But I couldn't sleep in it. You couldn't? I sleep on a Tempur-Pedic, and it's just two mattress pads, so it's like mm -hmm. not like a $1,000 Tempur-Pedic. It's like a couple hundred dollar cheap throw-together Tempur-Pedic with no pillow. I like laying like exactly flat on my back or like exactly like there's something about being flat. Like when I had really bad back pain, I couldn't even lay on couches because it has like where the cushions come together. And that would screw with me having like even just that littlest bit. Sure. I would just lay down on the ground sure. on carpet. I was like, for some reason, I'm like exactly flat is the way I am. But I imagine a lot of people aren't like that and they probably can enjoy it. Well, I was like that. Yeah. But then I got old. So you had back pain? Oh, yeah. And then Hammock got rid of back pain. Um, I have a lot of pain. So I have back pain, knee hip pain. pain, knee pain, left knee yeah, pain, left knee pain, and neck pain, shoulder pain. Though really, like, mm. and the so Drawing that's why I can't I can't times. sleep in a bed mm. because I 
I it's just painful. Uh, I have to roll over every thirty minutes. Shoulder get... from from drawing a bow ten thousand times a year. No. 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 Uh, so. My my left shoulder's been injured several times several times in like mountain bike wrecks mm. and um, working out. Happens. Well, good but, stuff. Is yeah. there any like closing thought? <laughs> <laughs> All right, not yeah. therapy. Thank I'm you. <laughs> hey, this is enough about you. No, um, is there any like things, closing things, like if anyone's made it this far, they're obviously like interested in a couple like sage words you have to say or calls to action. People like, hey, everyone should go try hunting or anything you Follow want to say. Follow you on YouTube. Yeah. You, what's, oh, your, what's your Twitter? Yeah, yeah do all that. Yeah. Um, the main thing that I w would say, like if someone li listens to this because of the Lyme disease stuff, which that doesn't seem outside the realm of possibility to me because it's when if you get Lyme disease you're looking everywhere for help mm. and um, just you know keep trying you know don't give up uh, it's a long road um, but you can get relief from the Lyme disease but it, it's very hard um, you basically have to decide are you going to go antibiotics or are you going to go herbs and which are, s s antibiotics work for some people herbs work for other people um you just got to pick one decide what works best with your lifestyle try it and if it doesn't work try the other one and um hopefully you'll get someone to listen to your story and believe that you're sick well, that sounds and like a hashtag you. we can all get behind is kill all ticks. Hashtag kill all ticks. That I can there get behind. There we go. Okay, yeah, I pitched a pretty, you know, ticks. maybe one that wouldn't work well in the show, but that, that's the uh, that's the official hashtag of the show. Hashtag kill all ticks and mosquitoes. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'll see thank you around you. town. Normally you live in Bend, but you'll be in Eugene for the summer. That's right. Good stuff. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye.